Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. I am your host, Renee Bauer, and I am here today with Melanie Hirsch, who is a psychotherapist turned dating and relationship coach who has been featured in Oprah Magazine and Psychology Today. She helps her clients skyrocket their self-esteem, step into their worth, and change their approach to dating so they can draw in a well-matched partner with more ease. So today we're going to be talking about all of the post-divorce things as it relates to building your self-esteem, finding love again, and building an authentic connection with a new partner. So hey, Melanie, welcome. Hi, so happy to be here. Oh, I'm so psyched to chat with you today. So, all right, like let's dive in. You are a psychotherapist, which I love that. So you have this this background that goes so much deeper than like we're a dating coach. Like you're you're diving in. You're like going like inside out. Yes. Uh, all right. So that's <laughs> cool. That's so cool. So <laughs> let's talk about post divorce. Everyone comes out a little bit bruised, a little bit broken, a little bit battered. Their egos are hurt. Their self-esteem is not at its best. So, but they want to start dating again. So where, where do they begin? Do they just say, well, let's just kind of fake it till you make it and throw themselves into the dating world? Or should they be doing some inner work first? Yeah. So I would say no to the faking it and making it because we can't fake you know, where we are emotionally and within ourselves. You know, we can, we can try to put on a good front, but it's going to come back and bite us in the ass. So it's, it's so important when you, when you're post-divorce and you want to get out there again, doing the inner work is so important. Make sure that you're, you've cleared out old wounds. You know, if you've got old resentments or hurts or insecurities and fears, if you show up to dating, with all that stuff, it's, you're not going to have the success that you would have if you do the work. So it's, it's a beautiful time to kind of dig in and look at what's going on under the hood, you know, what, what's happening. And uh, it's so important if you want a healthy relationship and you don't want to repeat the same patterns that you had in your last one. Okay. But to that point, someone says, but listen, my ex was a real uh, something or other, and he was horrible, and he did all of these awful things, and mm -hmm. he didn't validate me, and it was all him, and none of it was me. So what do you say to that? Uh, you chose him. Like, <laughs> yeah, he acted that way, but you were accepting it for that many years. You saw red flags and ignored them. And, and it's looking, it's so important to look at what had you pick that person and stay in that relationship when it was no longer serving you and when it no longer felt healthy. And so if, you know, if you've stayed in a relationship beyond when it felt good, there's some stuff to explore there as to why. And it's important to work that out before you get into your next relationship. What types of things um, have you seen or what types of things could people be be coming up for people who are staying in something really toxic or unhealthy? Yeah, I think a lot of times there's insecurities and fears that are really keeping people in, in that place. You know, fears, oh God, can I do this on my own? Or I've got kids or, you know, um, maybe there's not another good one out there. I should just make this work or, you know, um, I'm going to damage the kids if I, yeah. if we break up. So there's, there can be all these insecurities or I'm not enough. Maybe, yeah, maybe this is the best I can get because I don't think I'm attractive enough or, you know, interesting enough. Or so I think it's stuff like that, that oftentimes keeps people in a relationship that's not right for them, but they're afraid to leave because they're worried maybe I won't find that again. Or so it's yeah. so important to make sure that you pull those beliefs apart and really look at what's actually true? Like, is this really true or is this just a fear? So re being able to work with those beliefs and rewire them, that's a game changer. Now, is that something someone can do on their own or do you suggest that they have professional help to assist them in that, that unveiling process? Well, I, I mean, just in my experience, having professional help and having guidance in that area is so powerful and, and effective because, I mean, I, I know for myself, 
I spent so many years trying to figure this stuff out and piece it together, what was really going on that was getting in my way. And so, but when you get someone who has experience in this area and can help guide you through it, you can see results really quickly. You don't have to go through years and years of reading every book and taking every workshop. It's like, you can get the results right away. So I think having help and, and also we can't see our own blind spots really. Yeah. You know, and that's the tough thing. And, and we might have some insights as to what's going on. Oh, this is the way that my father treated me and I've repeated the pattern. So we might have insights, but, and insights are great and they feel good to understand and have clarity, but unless we know how to rewire some of our patternings to change it, we're just going to keep repeating the same, the same mistakes, Mm -hmm. the same patterns. So it's important to know how to reprogram you know, our default that is not healthy. Is that why we go for the same type of person who was a previous partner? Is that the reason that while they might not look the same, but deep down they have those same behaviors and patterns? Yeah, we're wired to be attracted to that kind of person. And I think a lot of it is, it's either, you know, a lot of times our limiting beliefs that we have will have us attracted to certain people. If we think, let's say I'm not enough, or I think I'm not pretty enough to get someone I want, then we're constantly going to attract in someone who's going to mirror that back to us and not choose us fully so that we can say, see, I'm not enough. Like, so we we attract people to validate that experience. So if you don't heal it, you're just going to keep drawing those people in over and over. And also, yeah, it's, I, I think our programming from when we're young, a lot of times, you know, what was modeled to us as a kid, we pick that up and then we just, those, those patterns that we see modeled to us, they feel comfortable. It's what we know. That's what love is to us. And so we start seeking those things and we attract in people a lot of times that remind us of our core caregivers or certain dynamics that we experience. So this stuff's, yeah, so important to, to look at and move through. Okay. So someone is ready to start dating. They're ready to put themselves out there. They've done the inner work. They're like pumped up. They're like, I'm ready for this. I'm excited for it. (laughs) Now what? Like, what do they do to, to start to attract the right person, the healthy relationship into their life? Mm. Well, first things first, make sure that you have done a deep dive within yourself. Make sure you're not walking around with unhealed pieces and and resentments towards your ex and uh you know fears and insecurities i mean that stuff is so important make sure that you communicate in healthy ways that you know you're not stepping into your masculine energy all the time and you know that you you want to make sure that you're balanced and healthy on the inside so that's the work that i always do with people and then once you've done that work it's about putting yourself out there if you're jazzed and you're super excited about it that's great you know go into it have you know, mellow out on the expectations, I would Mm -hmm. say. I think when we have high expectations going in, you're out there again, you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to find someone. (sighs) It's just really good to be patient and soft about the process because you're going to, in the beginning, you might find people that, you know, they disappear, they ghost, they don't show up the way you want. And so if you want to avoid constantly feeling disappointed, really lowering your expectations and just getting curious about people, you know, getting on online dating, connecting with people, being open, being curious, but not creating story. Uh, That's going to be really helpful. (laughs) Right. So you have the one conversation and already you're picking out your house and right. you're like writing out their last name, like, Oh my God, this looks so good. And their kids (laughs) would be friends with my kid. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, uh, and that stuff, it's like the only place that person can go is down. And when you yeah. built them up in your head, so to avoid disappointment and dating, stop creating the fantasies, like yeah. just be present, you know? And if you have a hard time being present, start meditating, do five minutes a day, learn to just be in the moment with what is versus creating stories hard that that's that's really hard to do that's something that it can be I mean, really hard yeah like it's it's and it's a practice too it cre- you have to create a habit of it and get used to doing it on a that's, on the regular and that's everything i feel like the work i do with people so much of this is implementing tools and practices into yeah. you know people's daily lives because that's the only way we can like rewire and change our default patterning. So yeah, yeah, it does take practice. Nothing changes. I mean, we don't really get to the next level if we're not 
working on something consistently. So, so you said something a moment ago, and I want to go back to it because I'm really curious about your take on it with you having that psychotherapist background. And it was the, the, the concept of forgiveness. I saw someone post on social media recently that, um, they don't like the idea of of forgiving your spouse, like giving them permission to not forgive, like not everyone deserves forgiveness. And I kind of read that and it's someone who's actually well known in the space. And I'm like, I don't think I can agree with that because I think that if you're holding on, if you're not forgiving, then you're, you're stuck and like, you can't move through that. So I'm curious about your take on forgiveness. Do you have to forgive a spouse? What if the spouse was, was abusive? Like, is that person worthy of your forgiveness? And is it even about them? Well, and it's not about them. And I think, I think forgiveness is for us um, so that we're not carrying that around. And well, you know, there's that, that famous well-known quote of like, uh, what is it? Resentment is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. I mean, when we're holding on to resentments, we're poisoning our own system. We become clenched. We become fearful. We don't want other people to hurt us in the same way. So there's this kind of invisible, you know, layer of protection we put around ourselves because we haven't cleared that out. So I think that forgiveness isn't about saying, what you did is okay and we're cool now, let's be buddies. No, that person may have done something that was really damaging and, and horrible, but forgiveness is about releasing releasing this idea that this person should have been some other way and, and just fully accepting what happened and yeah. moving forward. It's not about being chums with the person. It's about letting go of the resentment for you so that you can find peace and move forward. Yeah, I I agree completely. I think that um, I don't know how you move forward unless there is a forgiveness component to that and forgiving yourself for your role in relationship or staying too long or whatever. Totally. Yeah. People get so harsh with themselves. And also I think it's a red flag, you know, when, if you're out on a date and you're talking with someone and they clearly are not over their ex, like they're bad mouthing them and saying, oh God, she was awful. And I mean, oh, it was just, you know, really challenging and uh, I mean, that's a red flag. They're not over it yet. They're holding on to that resentment. And so they're yeah. not fully available to you if they're still hooked into that dynamic. Yeah. So it's important to watch out for it in others and to make sure that you've cleared it for yourself. All right. So let's talk about red flags. Okay. What, are, what are they? How do you identify them? Do you run as soon as the first one comes up? Uh, well, I think there's, I think what's important to do is watch out for yellow flags, right? So sometimes we might see what feels like a red flag. We're not quite sure. We're like, is it a red flag? Is it not a red flag? So I call those yellow flags and I say, just slow it down. Observe. If you get, I think red flags are, if something pings you inside, and it feels off. Like the person you're dating is being really critical of the server. They're talking down to people um, or they're inconsistent in how they show up. They're kind of hot and cold or, you know, they're, they're uh, bad talking their ex or things like that. I think it's so important to pay attention to how is this person treating other people? How is this person showing up in the world? Yeah. Um, and if you get pinged and something feels off, pay attention to that. I think a lot of times we brush it off and go, oh, you're being too critical and just be open-minded, but notice those pings and they're, they're yellow flags. Pay attention, observe, see if stuff keeps showing up. Yeah, it's crucial, you know, because I think that it's so important when we're picking people to really pay attention to those things. Oftentimes we get sidetracked with chemistry and we're just so hungry for connection and, and feeling seen and, and having that dynamic again that we just push it all to the side. And then all of a sudden you end up in this relationship that you never, that's not right for you, but, but you're so hooked in because now you're physical and all your yeah. hormones or you know chemicals are firing and now you're in it and it's hard to pull yourself out. So it's easier to get good at being discerning and pay attention to red flags. It's way more easier to do that than it is to pull yourself out of a relationship once you're in it. 
so true. So how do we build authentic connections with someone that we're dating, things are going well, and you think, okay, like this, this is good. It's everything is going well. Like now what, how do you take it to that next point where you are really connecting with them in a really authentic way? That's not just like the attraction and the excitement of something new. I think it's coming from a ground, when you come from a grounded place, like again, if you're creating story and you're kind of desperate or hungry for love and connection, then you're not going to be as authentic because you're kind of like, I want this person. I don't want them to go. And so you, you start acting weird, right? You, you're not being yourself <laughs> fully because you, a lot of people, a lot of my clients have a fear of like, if I do or say the wrong thing, they might you know, not be into that and go away. Yeah. So they try to really watch what they're saying and they become this version of, them, of themselves who, that they think the other person's going to like. You can't have an authentic connection yeah. if you're pony dancing around and trying to like be this version of yourself you, you, know, you think they're going to like. If you want an authentic connection and you want healthy relationships, it's about how you show up. Are you being authentic? Are you being real? Are you sharing what's true for you? Or are you holding it in, afraid and worried about what they think? I think the more that you're comfortable with yourself and you're just real and you go and you think to yourself, I I'm going to just be myself. And if, if they don't like it, cool, they're not for me. And if they yeah. do like it, great. Like if you can take that approach and and realize I'm looking for my best friend and I don't have to pony dance for my best friend. I don't have to, you know, do a whole thing. I get to like best friends, like it's an easy connection. It's about being real. So it's really, it's about you and how you're approaching it and how real you're being. And if there's insecurities coming up that are preventing you from being fully authentic, it's important to work with those and start looking at that. In your work with, with clients in this, do you see a difference uh, based on age? Like, I feel like once, once women get to a certain age, they really don't give an F about things and about people pleasing, like the way we did in our twenties or even our early or mid to thirties. Yeah. And like, you get, you kind of cross across a threshold. I'm just curious if you, you have seen that connection as well. You know, I actually, I've found that it's just regardless of age that women are having a lot of the same struggles. Mm -hmm. um, the women that come to me, they're snagged in this area. Like they're just going, what is going on? And so they're a little bit insecure. They're kind of coming in with these insecurities and they don't want to mess things up. They want to know how to do it in the right, quote unquote, right way. And so, um, I found, I mean, it would be great if at a certain age, it's just like, oh, right. all the insecurities disappear. But, you know, I've got a bunch of clients, you know, 40 through 60 too, that are yeah. still, you know, they're still struggling with that stuff. And maybe being out in the dating world is new for them. And, uh, you know, they were married and now they're getting back out there. And so, you know, dating triggers, it can trigger all your stuff, you know, anything that any insecurity that's buried down in there you know, go on some dates and boom, it'll come right to the surface. So <laughs> that's what I kind of love about it. Cause I go, it's such a, it's such a gateway to really do personal growth work and really heal on deeper levels. If we actually, you know, use these as op insecurities as opportunities to grow. How are we self-sabotaging relationships or new relationships? I think we sabotage them when we create expectations, unnecessary expectations early on. I think we sabotage it when we jump in and don't take the time to really get to know the person well, but we're coming from that hunger and desperation. I think we sabotage it when we have limiting beliefs and insecurities and fears that we haven't fully moved through. And so we're operating and we're choosing from that place. Uh, I think, again, when we haven't cleared uh, resentments, we sabotage it when we don't communicate in healthy ways. And we use, you know, we speak to our partner in ways that are where we're blaming them or shaming them, or how could you do that? Or, you know, that sabotages it. Like there's so many different layers um, and that's why I, you know, have these, uh, a 12 week course and we, you know, every week is a different layer because there's so many yeah. different things that we do that inadvertently sabotage our experiences and our chances at having a great relationship. What about boundaries? 
Do you have a, a layer yeah. of setting boundaries? I mean, a layer, I just, I think I, we do talk about boundaries. I mean, boundaries are sort of woven into everything yeah. because I think boundary, what a boundary is, is just honoring yourself. And so if you're not setting boundaries, yeah, it's so important to look at what's going on that you're allowing yourself to be walked on and you're not speaking up. Again, it ties into the authenticity and securities. Like it's all branches off the same tree. Hmm. So tell me a little bit about your course and the work that you do. Yeah. Well, my course, I have a course called Path to Love and it's my favorite thing. I love it mm-hmm. because it's this three month program where I really go through all of these different blind spots and, and things that get in women's way uh, in their dating and relationship world. And I love it. Yeah. We just dive in and it's women of all different ages, but I find, like I was saying before that regardless of age, people are having very similar experiences. And so it's so interesting to work with all these different women and and there's so many similarities. And so it's this beautiful community of women that are doing the work and really gutting all these different blind spots and all these different areas. Mm. And the focus is really on giving people tools and practices to rewire any areas that feel stuck. And that's the difference between, I think in therapy, it was more about holding space and, you know, holding space for a person and and it was more gentle. This is like, okay, I want to do more than hold space. I want to really help you create this change. So it's really about implementing practices into their lives to really rewire. And post-divorce, we hear over and over again, I'm never getting married again. I'm going to be single and alone. I'm just not any good at relationships. Do you think there's any truth to that statement that someone can just be not good at a relationship or is there a path to love like your course? And um, is there a, a way that someone can, can kind of show up in a relationship in a different way? Yeah, there is a way. And the the truth is, yeah, some people, maybe in the past, they haven't been great at relationships, but it doesn't mean they can't be, you know, there's, there's things that you can learn. There's things that you can work through and work on that will absolutely help you become someone who is great at relationships. I mean, I was a train wreck at relationship back in the day. I was so insecure. I mean, it was such a pain point for me. And I always say, it's like, if I could do it, if I can move through this stuff and move through the insecurities and become a little dating ninja, anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. So it just takes a a commitment and being willing to do the work and to explore and look in that, you know, lifting the hood and and looking under there. But I think if you're willing to do that and you're committed to it, a hundred percent, you can change your experience in your relationship world. It's so funny because I think that we do learn by falling in and like falling on our face. Cause I see the same oh, thing. Hey. I'm twice divorced. I'm like, I'm horrible at marriage. And then I did it again and figured it out. I'm like, but you learned, like I learned yeah. all going, I learned every step of the way, like what my non-negotiables were and how to be a better partner and what was, I wasn't willing to compromise in my own worth. And it's like, you go through those, those things, that heartache, the bumps and the, you know, and all of the potholes along the way. But then what happens at that other end is magical because there is, I think so much beauty. And even as a divorce lawyer, I can say like, I believe in love. Like there is so much beauty when you find someone, when you find someone who's your match. Yeah, I, I, I so agree. And I think I agree with you too. It's just, it's so valuable. Like there's nothing like going through something that's challenging and learning yeah. from it that, I mean, that's everything. And then you become stronger, you become more aligned, you have more yeah. clarity. It's, mm-hmm. it's really a gift if we can look at it from that lens. Melanie, how do people work with you, find you, reach out to you and all of the good things? <laughs> all the things. Well, I find I'm on Instagram a lot these days. Yeah. So I'm, I respond to DMs very quickly. So you can find me on Instagram at Melanie Hirsch um, and also my website, goodatyou.com. And uh, yeah, I offer these little 30 minute calls for people if they're mm-hmm. kind of can't figure out what their blind spots are and they're going, what's getting in my way? I can't really see it clearly. We'll get on a half hour call and I'll help you figure out what it is for you. So 
Love it. Okay. Final question then. What is one or two tips you have for someone who wants to find their own path for love? Where do they start? Mm, who wants to find their own path for love, meaning they want to they want to, they want to love again. They want to believe in okay. love again. Just wanting to get out there again. Yeah. yeah. I would say again, I'm like a little broken record, but take the time to work on yourself. Take the time to reflect on what you've learned from the past and gain some clarity of what's been going on and get out there. Make sure that you've done that before you get out there again. Because dating can be so fun and yeah. so invigorating if you've worked through your stuff. So really take the time to do that and it'll make all the difference when you put yourself out there. I love it. I'm not sure if this episode is going to be called Path to Love or Work Through Your Stuff. Either title uh, could work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be either, right? It's all the, yeah, it's all the same. We will see. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, Melanie. You were such a pleasure to chat with and thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you for having me.